Hello and welcome to Discover Downtown Stoughton. I'm your host, Derek Westby, here on WSTO-TV. Today we are at Yahara Chocolate and Tea at 261 West Main Street. Let's go inside and see what they have to offer. So we are inside Yahara Chocolate and Tea here in Stoughton, and I'm with the owner, Brooke Johnson. So Brooke, tell us about yourself. Well, like you said, my name is Brooke Johnson, and I've gone through life trying to find out as much I can about any particular subject than trying to share it with other people. So I went to school in genetics. Um, I worked on that for a while, but I did lots and lots of pottery. I spent more time in the pottery building, and I tried to do art fairs, and I hated that. So I started teaching, so I started teaching pottery. And then over the years, I kept looking for a new pottery studio. And when we moved here in Stone, we loved the downtown. And I found this building and I opened a pottery studio uh, because that's really what I love to do is, is teach pottery. And with the storefront, then I said, well, there are these people walking by and I can only do so much pottery. And let's start selling chocolate because I love chocolate. So I loved, I loved learning about chocolate and reading about chocolate. and and all of that and teaching people about chocolate. And so I started doing that and then that just sort of took off. So that's, and, and so my whole um, personality and what I love to do is learn as much as I can about something and then share it with people. All right, so first let's talk about the chocolates. How many different kinds of chocolates do you have and where do they come from? Yeah, well, so it was sort of by accident. The only reason I have so many chocolates is because people buy them, right? And people were really interested in them. So we have about 250 chocolate bars on the floor right now, which is the widest selection of any store within probably 500 miles of here. Um, and over the course of the year, we'll have about 400 different bars that will come through the shop. And we source them from a lot of US manufacturers because surprisingly the United States has the largest number of chocolate makers of any country in the world. Huh. But most of them are very small, like, like us. Um, like we make our chocolate and it's distributed here and at the Chocolate Enthusiast in Colorado, and that's it, right? So lots of them are very, very small. But so what I've been doing really is trying to find bars that are made at the origin where the cacao is grown, trying to keep all that production in-house, so to speak. So for example, this new bar from Ecuador, Cardenas, uh, Susana Cardenas is her name. She makes her bars from a single family farm called Tierra Hermosa in Ecuador makes all her chocolate in Ecuador, packages it all in Ecuador, and then I import it into the United States and distribute it and sell it, right? So that's really where I'm trying to find my chocolates. How can I find these growers, or like Metiche in Mexico is another one, made in Mexico by Fabiola in Guadalajara, right? And so I'm trying to find chocolates that explore the regions of where they're coming from, help you learn about the countries they're coming from and where all that production is done in-house, in, in the country of origin, and then I bring them into the United States and share them with, uh, with the public here. Okay, cool. Um, and you make your own kinds of chocolate. What kinds of different flavors do you have of your chocolate bars? Yeah, so I have a few of them here. And so we started making chocolate because during the pandemic, a lot of the U Wisconsin chocolate makers either contracted or shut down. And our best selling bar, I don't know if you've ever been out to Mount Horeb to Shulin's Chocolate, but that is one of the state's premier milk chocolate, really Wisconsin flavor chocolate makers. They make their own chocolate from bean to bar. They buy the beans, they roast them, they grind them there in Mount Horeb. They were my number one seller. And then during the pandemic, they contracted and they no longer offered any wholesale customers. They're like, what am I gonna do? I just lost my best selling chocolate bar. Well, so the best selling chocolate bar was called Lilyhammer. It was a milk chocolate made with Wisconsin milk and butter toffee and salt and cocoa nibs. And you put that all together and into a package and it absolutely was the best seller. People just loved that combination. So I said, well, what can I do to replicate that combination? So I talked to WM Chocolate, Will Marks and Madison about how he made chocolate and he doesn't make milk chocolate. And see, I even though milk chocolate is not my favorite, I predominantly sell milk chocolate in the shop. Uh, so then I made this bar. Our milk chocolate with Yahara butter toffee because that replicated the Lilyhammer bar that was my best-selling bar. 
And so that's why we started making chocolate, was to make a bar like this. Um, and it sells really well and people really love it. And this is the best seller at that chocolate enthusiast in Colorado. She absolutely loves this bar. Our best selling bar here in the shop though is our dark chocolate bar incorporating, incorporating Wisconsin ingredients, right? Chocolate doesn't grow here. So how can we make chocolate that represents what Wisconsin is? Well, Door County cherries. Everyone knows Door County cherries. And so we make a dark chocolate bar with Door County, dried Door County cherries that we chop up and mix into the bar so the cherry flavor fully infuses into the chocolate. And this is our absolute number one bestseller. It's not necessarily our bestseller outside of Wisconsin because Door County doesn't quite have that, that, that knowledge, right, that, that there's Door County. Um, and we also make an oat bar. So this is made with Heartland Craft Grains in Lodi. We use their oats and we use that and replace the milk in our milk chocolate bar with oats. Okay. So those are the three basic bars we make. We make this in a straight dark chocolate and we make this in a straight milk chocolate as well, but these are, these are our two most, two most popular. Do you have any like uh, holiday flavors? So we do seasonal bars. So our holiday seasonal bar is this one, the mulled cranberry oat. So this is our oat based chocolate but while we're grinding it with the oats, we add in all the traditional mulling spices. You have cloves and you have cinnamon chips and you have orange peel and you have all those holiday flavors. So that's ground for 48 hours in with the chocolate. Then we take another Wisconsin ingredient, cranberries, and we take dried cranberries and chop those up and put them into a bar. And so that is our holiday bar for the winter, is that bar oat-based. And that one's one of my favorites. Well, good, absolutely. <laughs> and for those who like something a little bit spicy, this is our, our our uh, Halloween or our fall holiday bar. And this is the same oat based, but this is with three Fatali peppers, which are sort of like cayenne peppers, but they're a little more citrusy, they're yellow. And we grow those in the back of the shop. And we take three of those, dry them and grind them with the chocolate for three days. So then that may, gives you a slight spicy edge to it. And so this is our, our fall holiday bar called Blood Moon. And we make this as a super spicy called the Death Wish Skull too but I think we're sold out of those, so. <laughs> All right. And outside of chocolate, you also have a whole bunch of tea. Yeah. Tell me about the tea. Yeah, so the tea and, and coming from the pottery side, so this really comes from the pottery side, is I love to make pottery for foods and cultures that really love pottery. Well, the U.S. isn't necessarily a pottery-loving culture the same way that China or Japan is a pottery-loving culture where foods and whole experiences are built up around the pottery structure and the pottery that you use in that. And so I came to tea from the pottery side in that looking at different ways that pottery was used in, in cooking, in, in, in ceremony, and all of that. And so I started making all these fun little tea bowls. And then I heard about... Uh, a guy who is doing a Taiwanese tea service. I said, oh, I want to go check that out. So I brought my big, you know, Japanese matcha tea bowl, thinking that's what tea was. And I got there and they had all these little itsy bitsy dinky little cups. Like, like holy smokes, it's, you know, I, <laughs> I had brought the wrong thing, right? And, uh, and so I started, well, what is this Taiwanese tea? What is this Chinese style tea that is not typical that we know in the United States? And so then I started looking into that, looking into the pottery that was used for that. And so then I started making the little itsy bitsy um, little cups. And so this would be a little Chinese or a little Taiwanese teacup. Um, and this would be a traditional uh, Chinese brewing vessel called a gaiwan. And again, it's, it's made out of clay. It, it's specifically made out of clay. Um, and, uh, and you brew it, you brew your tea in here, and then you hold it just a little bit, right? And then you're gonna pour it out. And so then this, and then you, you continually re-brew the tea. And so in this sort of vessel, you're dealing with a really high quality tea that you can brew 10, 20 times. Right, and you just keep rebrewing it and rebrewing it. And so I came to tea from making the pottery and then learning about how the tea is used in the pottery. And then also realizing I'm making all this crazy pottery that's all around and no one knows how to use it. So I guess I better learn how to use it and teach people how to use it. And in the process, I, I've explored and learned about the unbelievable history and, and interest in all these Chinese and Taiwanese and Japanese teas, where tea has been part of the culture for thousands of years, for a thousand years. 
Um, and there's just so much more to tea than what we experience and know of in the United States. So that's why on Saturday mornings, I've started doing guided tea services. So Saturday mornings at 9.30, if you come in, I will prepare one of the ancient teas, show you what it should look like, show you how you would brew it, show what it would taste like. And then after that, you get a sample to go home and, and try it yourself. And so slowly experiencing how within China, there's a different tea type in Yunnan, and there's a different tea type in Hunan, and there's a different tea type in Guangxi, and there's a different tea type, right? And they're all, you brew them a little bit differently, they taste a little bit differently, they're different styles, but, and so I have all those teas here now, and then I explore them with people and, and show them how, what they should taste like and, and what their history is, and so you get a teas that aren't in your normal oxidation level. Like you have white teas, which aren't really oxidized. You have green teas, which are, aren't really oxidized. You have black teas, which are heavily oxidized. You have oolong teas in the middle. A lot of these teas are beyond the black teas, because in China they call them red tea anyway. There is no such thing as black tea in China because it brews a red color, because they have what are called dark teas that brew so dark you can't see through them. And they can get really thick and really earthy and really, you know, so, and, and there's just so much interest in history there. And so going again, going through that, learning about that and then trying to share that with people and, and trying to get them maybe to buy some pottery along with it, right? <laughs> so, they, so they know how to use it. And so that's really where the tea came from. Um, and even though, even though my wife always says, yeah, no one drinks tea in the United States. And I say, well, but it's the second most popular beverage in the world after water. Yeah, but people here, only, people only want coffee. And I'm like, well, all right, well, I'll see what I can do. Not serving coffee and serving tea instead. So, you know, it's been, it will slowly find the audience and slow. And part of it was starting this guided service on Saturday mornings. Now I'm starting to find the people who are really interested in learning about it, where when it was just set up as a wall of teas back here, is a little bit more distant, it was a little bit more familiar, and then, oh, well, let's get an Earl Grey, oh, let's get a whatever, and it didn't get into that level of, let's learn about what's interesting about these ancient teas and where the, what the history is of, of the teas, and so that's what we've started, I've started to do on, on Saturday mornings. Cool. How many different kinds of tea do you have? I mean, there's quite a few back there. <coughs> yeah, so there are about 40 different teas back there, and those are gonna be good teas, not great teas, right? They're, they're going to be way higher quality than what you're going to get at the grocery store. Um, most of those, they're going to be whole leaf teas, so you can steep them two, three, four times. And there are about 40 of them back there. What I'm starting to prepare over sort of on this side of the shop, where we have some of these ancient Chinese teas, is I probably have about another 50 teas that aren't even out because they're teas that you, I won't serve to someone if they just want it to go because that's not the point of the tea. Right? The point is to sit down and understand it and try it and steep it more than once. So I have about 50 of those teas that I'm slowly bringing out and introducing to people, um, but they're not out on the shelf. And so those will be available in smaller quantities. They'll be available in little sample packs that I give that will have a single serving in them that you can take home and try. And they go anywhere from a farmer smoked Liu Bao, where they pressed it into a bamboo basket and then hung it over their fire for a week and to really get it smoked to one that's been aged for 25 years in a warehouse, slowly aging and turning into a really creamy tea, or ones that are from the highest mountain peak in the, in the Wuyi Mountains, right? That, that a, a, a cake that's 300 grams, you know, runs $1,000, right? And I just have a very, I ordered a very tiny sample of it just to try, because that was still 30 bucks. But you know, you gotta try some of these things that are, you just can't find anywhere else and, and are really fun, so. So I have, I have some of those that I'll, I'll share with people as well. That's really cool. Um, so in addition to the, the pottery that's for drinking tea, what other pottery types do you have in the store? So I make pottery for everything. So anything you'd use in the kitchen, from casserole dishes to mugs to vases to water pitchers to serving plates to dinner plates to, to cereal bowls, so all of that stuff I make. The most thing that I sell, most common thing I sell, of course, is a mug. Um, they sell lots and lots and lots of mugs, and they can go in the dishwasher, they can go in the microwave, you can put them in the oven if you want to make a lava cake, right? You can do whatever you want. And so we sell lots of mugs. Um, I love to make bowls and bottles and things like that. And we sell some of those, right? But, but primarily we sell mugs and that. I've come to terms with that. I used to not really like to make mugs. Because you know, you see, you see a, a mug, pretend this is a mug, right? You see a mug and it takes me maybe 30 seconds to make the shape but it takes a minute to put the handle on and another 
you know, minute to trim the bottom. And so you make the shape and you think you're done, but that's just the beginning of making the shape. You have all this other stuff that you need to do. And so I used to not really like doing it, but now I've come to terms with making mugs. I know, yeah, people love mugs, so I'll make mugs. I just limit to myself to 10 at a time. I can't handle more than 10 mugs at a time. So <laughs> that's, all, that's all I do now. But eventually we build up and, and I know I need to ha go into December having 100 mugs on hand or else I'll run out. Um, okay. And I, I didn't meet that goal. And so I'm probably going to run out, but you know, that's all right. And um, for people looking for you online, um, do you have a website and social media and that kind of stuff? Yeah, so everything chocolate and tea wise is on yaharachocolate.com. Everything pottery wise is not online except for classes because I'd have to take a picture of each individual piece because everything is unique and I didn't want to put those individual unique things, the time it takes to put that on Green Road Pottery. Um, isn't worth it. So I do have Green Road Pottery for class signups and some some clay on there, but for the most part, every chocolate bar I have in the shop is on Yahara Chocolate. Every all of those teas are on Yahara Chocolate as well. I'm working on getting the the Chinese teas on Yahara Chocolate, but that will be a January project, I think, after the holiday rush is over. Right? It's hard to you sort of when when holidays come, you know, when you get to the middle of November all your projects just stop and you just have to concentrate on finishing out the rest of the year, so. Yeah, um, so if people wanted to stop by, what hours are you open here? So typically we are open from 10 o'clock to five o'clock on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. On Saturday, we're open from nine until three. And then between Thanksgiving and Christmas, we're also open Sundays and Mondays. So we open more to give people more opportunity to come in because that's the busy season. But generally, we're going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, 10 to 5, Saturday, 9 to 5. We are hoping to expand those hours to be able to adopt, offer more early morning hours. We're still working on being able to do that. To do that, I think I'm going to have to succumb and offer coffee. <laughs> All right. And, and um, is there anything else that we've missed that you want to talk about, about this awesome store? Yeah, for sure. And, and really, I want the store to be a space where people can learn. So we can't really see it from this video, but in the back, I have a whole pottery studio. So even though I make pottery, most of what I do is teach pottery. And so I have a whole space in the back for teaching pottery. If you have never touched clay before in your life or your experience, you can become a member of the pottery studio and have open studio time. I do all take care of all your pottery, get it dried properly, fire it for you. You do your own glazing, right? So I have all that available to people as a pottery studio. So that's really, uh, a lot of people do that. And that's an important part of the shop is being able to offer that as well as offering monthly fun Saturday, make a garden fish, make a gnome, make a volcano, make a troll, you know, sort of fun kids classes where we have, we goal is 100% success. Anyone can come in and they'll have 100% success on what they're doing in the pottery. Uh, we do also offer chocolate talks where we go through like the chocolate, of, I'm gonna go through in February, I'm gonna do a chocolate history of Mexico and we're gonna feature the Metiche brand and talk about the history of chocolate. And so we do those talks, educational talks here as well. And if people have a question or wanna learn something about chocolate, about pottery, they can always just contact me and I'll create something for them to, to learn whatever it is that they wanna, they wanna know and tea as well. So if people want to come in and say, hey, you know, I'll say it's quiet. Come in at 10 o'clock on some some weekday morning and we'll sit down and I'll do I'll show you how to how to brew the tea you're interested in. So, OK. And if people want chocolate but don't know what kind, can they come in and say, I normally have this chocolate bar. Can you find me something like it or better? And you yes, can kind of guide them. It's really helpful if someone has a keyword or a country or something to help narrow it down because you have 250 choices. And if someone says in, well, but do you have anything, you know, that has nuts in it because they want nuts, well, then that narrows us down to maybe 10 choices. And now that becomes a manageable, manageable choice. Or I normally eat whatever Ghirardelli dark chocolate and I really love their 80%. And I said, oh, well, that means you can try one of our 90% then because you're going to have a way smoother chocolate. And if you're already used to the bitterness and the crazy darkness of a, of a Ghirardelli 80%, then you're gonna have no trouble going up to 90% with one of our chocolates. Um, so we can, yeah, we can absolutely do that. We also do guided tours. So if you don't know what you want, you can buy a pack of seven bars, 
for $45. It has a map, it has seven different chocolates in it, and you try all those chocolates and you tell us what your favorites are and then that will also help us figure out what you like in chocolate. Awesome. Um, well, that's all we've got for Discover Downtown Stoughton. Again, we're here at Yahara Chocolate and Tea at 261 West Main Street. Stop on by and take a look. Thanks for coming. Thank you. <laughs>